Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet a photographer that lives out in California. His name is Than Clark, and his website is thanclark.com, and he's also on Instagram under than underscore Clark. Not only is he a artistic photographer, but he does photography as a profession. He does photos for an auction house, and not only just an auction house, but he does like big ticket items. He discusses, and there's some examples in the episode if you're watching the video, but he has done like sci-fi movie props, photos for those that auction, like auction things that go for a lot of money. <laughs> and he takes pictures of them. And that was when I was first looking through his stuff, I was like, is he actually making this stuff or is he like manipulating it? Is it digital trickery? No, they're the real items. He has dinosaur bones and um, uh, Superman's cape, stuff like that. Very interesting. Uh, we talk about that, about how he even got into photography in the first place and it becoming part of his career. Really cool story. Great guy to meet. And then, of course, don't forget to go to my website if you're just hearing this podcast for the first time, TomRaysWebsite.com, and you can subscribe to the show. You can check out all the past episodes that I've done, see my daily webcomic that I do, and also check out my daily vlog, which follows my journey into supporting myself and the art that I do and the music that I do uh, through selling pop culture and vintage items because I love collecting them. And speaking of the music that I do, uh, my band Lorenzo's Music is going to be releasing a single and you can check that out. I'll actually post a link to it on TomRaysWebsite.com, but also on my band's website, which is LorenzosMusic.com. So check that out. We're going to be releasing a new song. The entire thing was recorded remotely. I came up with a method for recording music without being in the same room and using GitHub. And it's kind of a, a, a I don't want to go into the whole explanation here, but we use GitHub open source software and we actually share the files back and forth and are able to collaborate remotely and that's how this next batch of songs that we're doing was completely done and it's kind of a new experiment in deconstructing the way that we record music and it was kind of a fun thing to do. It was hard too but it was still fun. But anyway we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about my interview with Than Clark on Tom Ray's Art Podcast starting right now. Dan Clark. I'm a photographer. By day, I'm a commercial photographer. Uh, I work for an auction house uh, photographing large items like furniture and dinosaurs and things like that. But uh, of course, I do the artistic side of photography as well for my personal work. Okay, so I'm going to circle back on you photograph dinosaurs, but where are you located right now? Uh, Outside of Los Angeles, in Los Angeles County. Okay. So, oh, so you are somewhere where it's warm. Okay. We were just talking, I, I, before we were recording, we were talking about the places in America that are actually warm. And you're in one. Yes, I'm, I'm in one. Uh, and a few weeks ago, we, we had uh, wildfires up in the hills that we could see from our home. Right. So, uh, yes, very warm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, extremely warm sometimes. Yeah, and I, I guess that's the one drawback you have is you guys do have the uh, occasional fires going on. So, you know, fires and earthquakes, which uh, oh yeah, the earthquakes too. Yeah, it's it, and we actually the uh, same week that we had the fires going on, we did have a little earthquake too, and it was just oh. like really we don't we don't need all of this, right? <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough they took away your entire movie industry. Over there uh, in California. <laughs> yes. Well, not yeah. for you. I mean, you're a photographer, so you, you get to take photographs and you can actually go out and stay away from people. But first of all, before we talk about photographs again, mm -hmm. so dinosaurs, what do you mean you're taking pictures of dinosaurs? Um, sure. Well, in, uh, as I said, I, I work for an auction house. And oh, we, okay. Uh, we, this, that's, that's my day job. Uh, I'm a photographer and I, I'm kind of their large item specialist uh, huh. so it it can sometimes it is something like a, a dinosaur I've, I've photographed you know like a full triceratops uh, like statue skeleton. 
Oh, yeah. skeleton yeah, it's, even. It's, okay. Yeah, the actual, you know, what they do is they'll take the bones and they'll piece them all together so it looks like, you know, what a triceratops used to look like. Huh. Um, and yeah, those get auctioned off. So uh, sometimes it's something like that. I'll also photograph uh, motorcycles, like Evil Knievel's motorcycle, and oh. um, or <laughs> sometimes it's movie props. I've, I've photographed uh, Robbie the Robot from Forbidden Planet, uh-huh. um, also a, a Darth Vader. Uh, you know, costume and various uh, items. So it, it can be as boring as shooting, you know, a 200 year old dresser that mm-hmm. just, you know, it is what it is. Right. Uh, but yes, every so often I get to photograph something that's actually fun and yeah. enjoyable. And, and, and I was, I, the other day I was actually photographing uh, dinosaur bones and teeth and things like that, but I was also photographing uh, meteorites and one of my uh, co-workers, he was like, so wait, we're photographing dinosaurs and the things that killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> nice. I'm like, yes, it's the whole, the whole package. Yeah. Full circle. It, it, yep. yeah, I love Full it. Full circle. <laughs> yeah. how, how, did you, how did you get in that kind of line of work? It's fascinating. Oh, I have so many questions I want to ask right now. And also so <laughs> many things b- were explained from what I've been looking at of your work from that as well. So let's start with how, how did you get involved with... Uh, taking photos for an auction house. Sure. Um, I I have to go back way back to um, my obsession, you know, with photography. I was originally an English and philosophy major at a big school in in the East on the East coast. And I I realized I was spending just too much time in the dark room and I'd always loved photography and, and had been uh, processing my own film and printing and, and, but I, I just kind of thought of this, oh, you know, being a photographer, that's that's like a dream job. You mm-hmm. know, that's a, that very few people get to do that. And, um, you know, so I I left after two years uh, at this big school, you know, had to do a little soul searching and, and you know, bounced around a little. Um, ended up working as a professional magician uh, in restaurants. <laughs> I know it's a it's a tangent. Did um, you already have a background in magicry? I, I guess I don't know what you would. I, call it. I, you know, it's it's one of those interests that just kind of came along uh, for the ride, and I I fell into it. You had your own top um, hat, and they said, "Good, you're halfway there." Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I had the costume. I had the look. It was all. No, my my grandfather had always shown me magic tricks, and oh, so wow. I was always uh, um, interested in in that and. Uh, so yes, I, I started doing uh, restaurant magic, which is as people one does. Would wait. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Card tricks and sure, of course, <laughs> a well-rounded life. Well, I I had been um, while I was doing that, I was also you know working at a at a hotel, and I was sitting with a friend one night because we were the overnight shift, and she decided, you know, I'm going to write a book. She's like, I'm I'm I've got to change my life. I'm going to write a book. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to school and study photography. We, we made this decision, uh, you know, the same, the same night. And I had no idea how I was going to do it, but uh, I applied uh, to a place out here in Santa Barbara called the Brooks Institute of Photography. At the time, there were two places you wanted to go to school. It was either Brooks or it was the Rochester Institute of Technology. And I thought, do I want, you know, do I want to live in Santa Barbara and photograph the sun or do I want to live in Rochester and photograph snow <laughs> and cold? <laughs> so I, I managed to get out here to, to do it and, and I got my degree. Now my degree is in commercial advertising photography. It was always with the goal though to make art. I mm-hmm. wanted the skills of a commercial photographer because to me it just represented the pinnacle of, of, of skill in, you know, to be a photographer is, is that just that level of control uh, that commercial photographers uh, do. And I was, I was looking at work like from the Smithsonian magazine and, and, and just, you know, beautiful photography. And I'm like, okay, I need to be able to do that. I was already creating my kind of own art, but I just wanted, uh, I wanted that commercial level. So I got my degree at, uh, at Brooks and, I uh, 
again, I, I, you know, I did some assisting, which is, which is a normal route for a commercial photographer. You, Makes you assist a, an established photographer for a while. Um, I also got into marketing for other photographers and working for photographical educational companies. I had actually been working doing marketing communications for a photographic lighting company, and then, a, uh, but uh, that kind of I got laid off from that. And a friend of mine was like, "Hey, do you know anyone who might be interested? I know you're not interested in this job, but do you know anyone who might be interested in in you know coming to work for us at the, at, at this auction house?" And I'm like, "You know, hold on, I think I know somebody." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so yeah, that's kind of how I. I fell into it, and uh, it wasn't until years later. I, was, I for, forget who I was reading, if it was Derek Sivers or someone. They they had this concept of let your day job kind of be your patron. Yeah. Um, so you know, if you're an artist and you're you know, as every artist is a struggling artist, um, you know, but if you can find work in a related field, uh, then that's a really good thing. And so yes, I get. I get paid to, you know, practice my my skills and keep my skills sharp and to to learn on the job and things like that. But uh, yeah, I, I I'm shooting every day and and I never tire of it. I can always go out on the weekends and that's more when I go out and create art. If I'm shooting on the street or sometimes I'll I'll shoot something in the studio uh, for myself. Yeah. yeah. Well, and yeah. even the the jobs leading up to that, I mean, you were doing like lighting and everything. You were able to hone like the other technical aspects through through things that you were doing from what it sounds yeah. like. Plus, mm -hmm. the way I see it is with the auction house, you get and looking at your photography, which, like I said, explains a lot from the photography I saw. You get to take pictures of things that you would not normally have the opportunity nor the ability to set up. Like I was looking at things where you have like the death of Superman Cape, you have like, um, what was it? The, uh, I think it was the mighty terror outfit or something like that. It was something, it was no, 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 no. no. Uh, it was some superhero outfit that had a big T on it. And I forget which superhero that is. Oh, oh, it, that was a uh, turbo man from jingle all the way. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Was, so not as cool as I thought it was, but, <laughs> <laughs> but still I was looking at those and I had all these questions. I'm like, are you manipulating these things? Are you and you? And I saw the ones where you were doing Darth Vader and all that, but no, you work for an auction house. That's amazing. So none. So while I was thinking like half of your work is actually like digitally manipulated. No, it's not. That's fantastic. Wow. Okay. So let's see. Now I got to try and organize all the thoughts that are in my head. So uh, when you take these photos, um, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the beauty of it is, is you're on both spectrums of the uh, Antiques Roadshow. You get, like you said, you get the, here's, here's a dresser that for some reason is very sought after and was owned by like Thomas Jefferson or something. And then next it's like, yeah, the, the whole Darth Vader and Star Wars things. So yeah. when you get those, like, do you just look at the docket and, and like, how do they go? Okay. We need you to come in and take pictures of this. Or is there just a big pile of stuff and they go now take pictures of these? Like, what's the process? Um, you know, a lot of times we're working off a list, you know, we have a list of, of just things we have to get shot, uh, with some of the more important items. It's, uh, you know, we know they're coming. And uh, do they you know, come to you? We'll schedule a date. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. No, it's it's. I I actually work in. Uh, a, I have a studio inside of the warehouse where we keep all of these things. Oh, fun. so it's it's not a it's not a uh, you know it's not a long trip. <laughs> okay. <them>. But <laughs> um, they don't like deliver them and drop them off in your backyard. No. no. <laughs> okay. And I I wouldn't want them. Uh, no. I wouldn't want that stuff coming to my my house. Uh, you know, some of it is like I shot Robbie the robot and that sold for I think above six million dollars of course it the did most expensive <laughs> movie prop of all time wow um at the time yeah no I, I I don't want that near me and I actually I don't um I don't look at the value of something before I I shoot it I don't want to know I don't uh it's it, it skews your value I mean mm -hmm. I I have shot tables that are practically falling apart but because they were made by, you know, so-and-so it's, it's worth $200,000. It's, yeah. you know, 
and then I've shot things that I thought were really cool, some really cool like Art Deco pieces, and and maybe it's only five hundred dollars. Uh, so, to me, monetary value just it it does it's next to meaningless. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it it's is it is the item cool? Is it uh, is it something that I is interesting to photograph? Uh, yeah, it's I don't even I don't even ask. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to know. And you're in one of those weird areas of being a photographer with the job where um, even with everything that's going on right now, there's still a demand for it because of online sales and things. So you're you're part of the select few artists who kind of, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, lucked out in that category because a lot of it is done online or over the phone. Um, yeah. Um, you know, we had a we had a short break. Um, we had about a three month break. But uh, after that, we're back to work, and we're, and I actually haven't been, you know, busier uh, when it comes to to work. It's just, uh, yeah, it's one of those weird ironies because of the that business tends to be a lot of high end customers. They just have not been uh, hurt as much. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got I got lucky, but there, you know, there's no way to to pre plan that or to no. to think that through. Is it was accident. Yeah. What, and I mean, even I like to say, I always like to make sure that I have a backup plan, but it doesn't mean that you can prepare for everything. Like there's, there's always yeah. something to fall back on where I'm like going, and if something goes wrong, then I could just steer really hard into this particular thing or whatever. And, and for me, it kind of went the same way as I lucked out with, I was making money on the side selling pop culture, vintage collectibles, but not in the scale that you are like mine. Th this is why it fascinates me with the taking the photos, because for me, it's, I'm not selling things that are like, you know, oh, it only went for 500. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm selling things for, I, I'd be happy if something went for 500, not going to happen. So it's a lot of quantity over quality on my end. But with yours, like, what is the, what is the process like how many photos do you have to take? Like how long does it take to actually picture an item? Like I'm curious what, what big ticket items like that and the type of uh, photographic differences between taking pictures of an item or doing artistic photography. So a lot of right. questions I just threw at you there. So <laughs> well, let me take whichever one you want. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me, uh, let me start with the difference between uh you know, the working day and then, and then creating artistically. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like to think of kind of, you know, what does the photograph need to be? And that, that applies artistically and, uh, it applies, you know, for the, for the, the business auction world. Um, with an item that is coming up for, for auction, it's, it's really, uh, clarity. You want to show in one photograph, you know, you want to find the best angle that shows the most amount of detail uh, so people can see what they're getting. That is what those pictures need to be. Um, you know, they need to be uh, good enough so that someone looking at it online can get a sense, oh, if I was there in person, I would, you know, this is how I would see it. Um, so I don't try to put, I, I really don't try to put too much creative thought into some of the straightforward stuff. Now, if it's a big, if it's a big item like the Darth Vader, the Robbie, the robot, you know, we'll schedule a full day, uh, to shoot. And then I'll do creative because I know some of those shots are going to go for, you know, the cover of the auction catalog. Mm, yeah. That's, that's where creativity comes into in, in that process. Um, you know, with the artistic photography, Yes, there is that sense. What does the the photo you know need to be, and also, what am I trying to say, uh, you know, with the the photograph? Um, so yeah, there there are similarities, but uh, in that, I I like to think of the work as something that's outside of myself. Mm -hmm. um, in that, uh, you know, I don't identify myself with my photography it, that might seem a little weird but if I take a photo that I really that I really like and I think oh this is good I enjoy it for about 24 hours you know and and I'm like okay I like this I'm proud that I, I did it now the weird thing is I, I can still appreciate the shot but but after that 
it, it's like it's not a part of me. It, it's out, and, and I can come back to it and go, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good shot. But I never feel like I made that shot. Uh-huh. You know, I, I know intellectually that I did. It's just emotionally, I, I guess I've released it out into the world and, and um, I'm kind of done with it. Uh, yeah, it's a, a weird thing, but um, I think it, it, it works for me. Um, it works for me because it just, my ego never gets into that sense like, oh my God, I've taken all these great photographs. It's <laughs> like, no, I I feel you know, I feel like an amateur. I feel like that amateur kind of mindset when I'm, I'm photographing. It's still a struggle. It's, it's still like, ah, uh, you know, am I going to get this? Am I going to do this right? Am I going to, you know, is this going to work? Yeah. Um, and, and I like that. I, I, I think if you get comfortable with that creation process, then, uh, I, I just think you don't create interesting work. Yeah. I, I so get what you mean too, because I kind of had a similar thing last night or kind of like, so tell me if this makes sort of a similar case for it in writing music. Like I've been in the process of writing a couple of singles in a row that I'm going to be releasing. And the first one, I was like, this is fantastic. And I was really into it and we're, we're in the process of mixing it right now, but I've already come up with four other ideas. And last night, I came up with a new idea that I was really happy with and I liked the direction it went and I was listening to it on the way home. And then after that, listened to the one that we're mixing again and was like, God, this is garbage compared to that one. And you know, like I've moved on from it. I'm like, that's not even as good as I know we can do something different now. And it's, it's because you're putting out one piece. It's not a body of work really in a sense, or at least that's the way I view it. It's like each it's it's like the old saying, you're only as good as your uh great, I'm gonna mess up this whole saying, but it's like you're only you're only as good as you're your only last as good you're only as good as the last saying that you're able to quote correctly. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it well, it's something like you're only as good as your last failure, kind of like my uh, that exact statement yeah. that I made. Now yeah. everybody's the, the the snippet I'll use for this will be me not saying the thing right. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant. But it's something like that. Um, and it's like, that even applies to yeah. your own, your own work. I feel sometimes if you're an artist, it's like, Oh, the thing I did before this, I don't even want that out there anymore because I love the thing I right. just did now even more. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I always wonder how, you know, very popular like musicians, it, it's like, how can, how can they do it? How can they, they, it, it, it has to take a lot of, I think discipline for, you know, take someone like Elton John who, you know, when he's out on the road and, and you go to an Elton John concert, mm. you know, there are songs you want to hear, he better play them, right. you know, and there's songs that, that he wrote, you know, or, or, you know, with Bernie Taupin like 30, 40 years ago. Right. And he's had to play those songs and it and, you know, I, I really admire that they can do that because to me, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't want to, you know, I'll look at something I did five years ago and go, ah, yeah, I don't want the world to see this. But do you keep it out there though? Is that the, that's, that's the real struggle. Is that like, do you delete it from the world knowing it or do you go, nope, that's still representative. And you kind it's kind of like a hurdle of your own because nobody else is yeah. knowing the struggle that you're going through. They just think it's no. good. So do you keep yeah. it out there? or Do you do the thing that nobody knows you're going to do where it's like, ah, just delete it. And now nobody's the wiser. I, you know, I've gone through some website redesigns where it's like, yes, work has come off, but I, I, um, I'll, I'll leave it up if it's something I post on Instagram or, or put out there. You yeah. Know, I, I will leave it up because it's, there's a photo I took and I, I, it's, it's just a silhouette of a bicycle that I took on a dock in Santa Barbara. And, you know, my, my stepbrother loved the photograph. He thought it was great. And, and even after I took it, I'm like, well, I guess it's okay, but you know, um, and I don't see what he sees in the photograph, but that's not, again, that's not my job. Right. You know, it's, it's, that's my, if he loves it, that's great. If it connects with him for some reason, that's great. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons why I, I don't like to put out a lot of, 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 of things where I'm talking about what I thought when I was creating a piece, mm -hmm. you know, like, like what I'm trying to communicate. I'll, I'll do it once in a while, but, but for the most part, I like to stay silent on that. It's why I don't, I don't title my photographs because 
everyone's going to come to a, an image, any image, with their own you know, preconceived notions, and they'll yeah. interpret it in their own way. And I don't want to take that away from them. That's, mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's their relationship with, with a, a piece of art. It, it has nothing really to do with me. If I photograph something and I think, oh, this is, you know, this, this is about loneliness or something, mm-hmm. and then someone else comes to it and goes, oh, it reminds me of my grandmother. I love that. You know, I, I don't want to, if I say, hey, no, this photo's about loneliness, then then I've taken away their interpretation. And I don't want to do that. You know, that's that's not my my business. Um, and I think sometimes when you title a, a work, uh, you know, once in a while, yeah, sometimes it can have that effect is, as well. For me, I want it to be there in the image. You know, whatever you take from the image, I want you to get it from the image. Once in a while, you have to break that rule, but uh, mm-hmm. generally, that's how I, I operate. Well, and it can also alter, yeah, the, the title can alter what it is by suddenly you're like, wait, is this an ironic thing that they're trying to do? Like, the, kind of like uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino marrying uh, 60s, you know, popular radio songs with murder. You know, th- yeah. that's sort of like the whole, uh, what's that, uh, stuck in the middle with you thing. Who would have thought yeah. that that would have been a gruesome horror scene? But <laughs> at the same time, it worked perfectly with it. Really, I, I thought that was an homage to Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my God, actually, that's kind of an interesting thought. <laughs> and horrible, but yes. Yeah, yeah, and and you know what's interesting, it's certainly in that case, is that you cannot hear that song. If you've seen the oh, movie, yeah. <laughs> you cannot hear that song and... You know, get or that do the dance. Your head. You yeah, know. yeah, the dance with the the straight razor. Yeah, uh, keep one on hand just in case I hear that song. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, yeah, it, it's uh, you know, it's it's funny. It's and that's what I'm trying to avoid mm-hmm. by not titling things. It's like let somebody feel about the work what they feel about the work. And that's exactly right. You you made probably the perfect point at the end, whereas now you can't hear the song without seeing that. And it's it makes it so nobody can have their own connection with it. And when it what it comes down to is when we make stuff, we really do want people to feel a connection. And whether or not that connection aligns with yours, at some point it doesn't really matter. It achieved its job. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless, of course, it's like you know Ronald Reagan using born in the, born in the USA for his campaign, but <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I look, I I can understand uh, how that would irritate a musician, and and if someone wanted to use one of my photographs for something like that without permission, I, yeah, I, I would feel uh, the same way. Well, what kind of license do you use on your on your photographs? Do you do you copyright oh, them or do you like? Because that's the other thing is putting stuff online. Mm-hmm. A photograph is probably one of the easiest things to share, and I know mm-hmm. that there is a stigma with you know a problem with people putting their photographs online, and some of them don't like it or they don't put all of their photographs online because right. of that. But right. do you use things like Creative Commons or do you do a strict copyright? Do you do takedowns? Like, what's your process for that? You know, I, I think that a lot of the people who are overly, who are very concerned with with copyright, they they fall into you know uh, kind of two different characters. They're either you know a very uh, you know high end professional commercial photographer who's you know they've had their work stolen and you know they're constantly licensing their work. Um, you know this was an older kind of business model where you might photograph something that was generic enough to be able to sell, to be able you know to to sell for like stock photography later on. And yes, you very much had to protect you know your copyright, and you wanted to make sure all your images were submitted to the copyright office. You know every image that you create is already copyrighted. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you already have some protection. Uh, you'll be, you know, so if someone steals it and they use it, you will be able to get the money back for, you know, that that use. But you don't get your legal fees back, and and you don't get damages, and mm-hmm. and um, so so that is one case. Uh, then the other case is usually people who are, you know, they're more on the amateur level, and they're very worried about people stealing their work. I don't worry about that because, you know, we should all be so lucky that that we get famous enough that someone wants to steal your work, or or that you're creating work good enough that somebody else wants to steal it. That I think is the first place that you want to get. 
um, you know, I've had people take some of my photographs and, you know, they've put them up on their blog and they've talked about them. But it's always been from the standpoint of, I really like these and, you know, here's the guy. And, and I, that only does, that only helps me out. You know, mm -hmm. that only, that helps me out. Now, I've only really had one case where I felt a photograph of mine, the concept was was stolen you know that that really uh yeah it, and it was i had i had done a photograph uh happened to be it was a new york uh you know let's see the natural history museum i believe and it was a silhouette of a mother and a, a son in front of these ibexes i believe um and the mother's leaning down to the son as the son's pointing up and it was this nice little moment that i took and and it was published uh, years ago, Canon kind of had the, a little online magazine. And so uh, it was published in there with an interview. And a few months later at a New York photo convention, someone's like, hey, are they using your photograph to promote this convention? And I'm like, no. And I see a photograph in front of the same place, you know, very similar framing. It was mm -hmm. in, shot in the exact same location oh. with a different silhouette in front of it. And I was like, yeah, that looks a lot like my photograph. It doesn't have the same impact as I thought mine did. But it was done by a more um, a more well-known photographer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I just realized there's there's nothing to be done, you know. Um, and I have I have no way of proving he saw my photograph, even though it was published and it was you know published by Canon in their magazine. I have no I have no concept. He could have stumbled upon the same photograph as, or the same type of image as I did. Um, or Canon could have and, said, we want a photo like this, not giving them a frame of reference for, you yeah. know. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, you know, I have no proof and uh, nothing was, nothing good was going to come from it. Yeah. From me being upset about it or from me, you know, I didn't have any kind of a, a case. It happens, you know. It, so, you know, the, the healthiest thing in that point is to let it go. <laughs> right. And just go, okay. Well, you know, I, I, in some ways it's validating. It's like, okay, I had a much better known photographer, you know, do a similar image that he thought was good. So, all right. <laughs> yeah. And that's the way I see it too. Like, uh, I know there's the worry of people stealing your work, but I think the same way. I'm like, if somebody did of note and was it steals something that I did or use it for something and didn't ask permission or didn't give attribution or didn't uh, compensate me for it. I'm going to shout it from the rooftops and make sure everybody knows so that it will get picked up. That actually kind of happened only it was accidentally to me once. Um, mm -hmm. One of the first album covers we did was designed by, we had a member in the band who, uh, who used to be in the band who his wife was a graphic designer and she was in Chicago and we were doing our first EP and there was this 1930s world world's fair that was held there. And it was like space themed or something. I don't know. It was like a picture of a planet with like a ring that swooped around it and it was graphically designed. And she was like, I want to design the album just like this. And I was like, you do that because that's fantastic. You know? So she did years went by things changed, whatever. And then in the mid two thousands, uh, Bad Brains, which is a band that I that I like, they mm -hmm. had Shepard Fairey did a new cover for their album that was just released, and it was called uh, it was called Rise or something like. No, not Rise. That's a different album entirely. Great. Now I'm not going to remember the name of the album, but it was an album that Shepard Fairey, the artist, did. Yeah. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like listening to the album, looking at the cover, and all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute! And I turned it upside down, and I'm like, that's the design that's on our first album. And I'm looking at it going, holy crap, and forgetting, okay, years had gone by. When this album we did, it was in the 90s. The yeah. album that they did was in the mid-2000s. And I'm like going, oh, wow, did they use our album artwork? That's awesome. And I thought it was cool, and I posted it on our website. Next thing you know, it got picked up on Reddit, and then Noisy picked it up, and Vice.com picked or That's the same thing, oh, Noisy gosh. Vice. And like all of a sudden, it, did Bad Brains steal this artwork? And all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I didn't oh. say that. I just said it was the same right. artwork. And so all of a sudden we, and the thing was, is all of the people who have bad brains came out and they're just like hating on us, 
But oh no. Well, and I also got a so and this is what I didn't know. Shepard Ferry was actually going through the court case for the Obama Hope Obama, thing at the time. Yeah. And I had yeah. no concept that he was literally being sued for <laughs> appropriating someone's pho- photography. And here I said this about him using our artwork and everybody's like, he's doing it again. And I was like, what is he doing? I thought, right. I just thought it was cool. So oh. he actually called me on the phone. I had Shepard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The phone I've, I've actually tried <laughs> calling the number since then and it's been disconnected, but I used to have his phone number on my phone and he called me and I explained to him and I was like, no dude, I was literally going, this is really cool. I wasn't going right. like, how dare he? And he was yeah. like, that's what I thought. And, and very nice. It was a cool conversation. And, uh, then, yeah, but we got bashed online. But on top of oh. that, we also, but yeah, yes, it's oh, but also our listenership went up tons, you know, right. and we still got new email signups and we actually got lots. So with the hating came the people going, oh, check out this band. That's really cool sort of thing. So yeah. there's that. There's it's all of it came with, and I wish I would have been able to wrangle it better back when it happened. You know, like now I know more of what, how I would have handled it and what I would have done. And I think it could have gone even farther. And that's the other thing about, about people using your stuff is it's like, if somebody did something like that, I would shout it from the rooftops even more, or, you know, just bring it up because who knows how much it's going to skyrocket regardless of what side you're on. I I can, I, I certainly see that, that point and it's good that that, you know, worked out. Uh, for you, you know, for for me, I've I've had this philosophy that, look, if if someone were to copy my work, yeah, I can get upset about it, and mm-hmm. I'm sure I, I would for a little while. But but at the end of the day, I can create another photograph. I I know that I have the skills, and I know that I've you know uh, I've worked hard so that I I would be able to take that photograph. Now, someone who just goes out and copies, they don't have that. They have to take it from somebody else. They have to take that inspiration, that 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 level of creativity from somebody else. Um, and so for them, they're always going to have to copy something. And I know that, no, I could go out tomorrow and I could create another image. Um, so in a way I do, you know, I feel sorry for, uh, for people like that. I think there's been a lot of confusion in in the art world and in you know the amateur art world if such a thing exists about what it means you know if you've heard the uh, Austin Kleon has a book Steal Like an Artist and mm. it's supposedly you know based on and, and nothing I love Austin Kleon by the way uh, I read his his blog and everything he's he's great I recommend it but the quote supposedly was a Picasso quote where, you know, it's saying that bad artists, you know, copy great artists, steal right. kind of a thing. And I, I, I think people have really, and, and I don't even know if he actually said it because I believe it's traced to Steve Jobs. No, it's originally. beyond that. Actually, it's traced back to like T.S. Eliot or, uh, or Orson okay, Welles yeah, or something right, like that. Back. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's hilarious that that quote is stolen. Um, I, I don't use those words. I'm very sensitive to to language and how that affects actually visual items. Uh, I don't steal. You know, I don't I don't like that that word because that that does imply that you're taking something, you're not giving something back, you're not transforming it. You're just taking something that doesn't belong to you. I I prefer I draw inspiration. Mm-hmm. I draw inspiration from other artists. There are other artists that inspire me, and I might, quote unquote, steal. But but when I am looking, like Edward Hopper, Edward Hopper is one of my you know inspirations. I love the way that he uses space, and I use that as inspiration for some of my photographs on how I use space. You will never look at my work and say, "Oh, that guy's taken from Edward Hopper." Mm-hmm. You'll never see it you'll never see it. Um, it's not that I'm hiding my tracks. It's just that, that I'm, it's transforming. I'm transforming it. Uh, so yes, I do look at other artists. I do take inspiration from them, but yeah, I just, you won't catch me using the word like, Oh, I, I steal. Right. Uh, it's just such an know. extreme. It's like using the word hate. It's like, you really have to mean it if you use that word, you know, especially, yeah. and like with stealing, unless of course you're in sports and then that's just slang for you stole base or something like that yeah you know but you know there's this concept and and that well there's nothing new under the sun it's all been done everything is just a rehash 
you know, Shakespeare wrote all of the stories, so <laughs> there's nothing new. Allegedly um, wrote the stories. Right, right. <laughs> Whoever you want to attribute them to. And and even if that were true, I don't think it's a useful thought. I yeah. don't think it's a useful thought for anyone to keep in, in their head. Um, because it lends you to to believe, oh, well, no, I can't create something new. But in fact, there's plenty of evidence that, that new things and original things um, – you know, have been created mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, or put together in, in new ways. And I think it's much better for an artist to, to, to keep that in mind. Like, what can I create that is new, that is, you know, original. And each that person is... has their own preference, you know, it's mm -hmm. it, it, like what I just thought of when you said, like, it's already been done. I literally have a coffee shop that I go to that's across the street from another coffee shop, but I prefer the one that's over here because of the people that are in it. And truthfully, their beans are better. So it's, yeah, I mean, but two coffee shops exist by each other and they've been there for years. Not to collate coffee with taking photographs, no. but yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, and here's another thing that I thought of too was, and not that you're necessarily using it for commercial use, but just as an example for your work, but some of the things you take photos of are actually copyrighted materials, such as the Superman cape or the um, Jingle All the Way. Is that what it was called? Jingle All the Way? Uh, yeah, Jingle All the Way, the Turbo Man. Yeah, yeah sure. things like that. Those are some of the examples on your website. So mm -hmm. what is the... What is the availability of it? Is it just that you're doing it as fair use or because you're not commercially deriving from it, but they are works that you took pictures of? Like, what is the area of what you're allowed to use, even though you're taking commercial pictures? Sure. Like, sure. do you own them? Like, what's what hap How does that work? No, no, I don't. Um, you know, technically, anything that I do uh, in that case would be, you know, considered more work for for hire. Um, so I don't own them. Uh but I also, you know, I am uh, putting on my website things that have been published, that have been put ah. out there already um, on the internet. You'll you'll never see anything I've I've shot if that photograph has not come to light somewhere else. When it comes to the the commercial work, uh, I don't sell the photographs. I don't. Uh, I just put them up there as examples of my portfolio. Okay. So I'm not I'm not going to make you know, I'm not making money off of, of that in any other sense than this is what I can do. Okay. So and nobody's ever come after you going like, Hey, you can't put that up there. That thing is now owned by whoever bought it or whatever. Um, no, no one's, uh, no, I don't know why they would, no. but it's just, it's a goofy world and you never, sometimes but, but people, it's, it's just it's, like, what? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, when I'm like, look, I, I take a picture of Darth, of Darth Vader. Well, I don't own a copyright to to Darth Vader, obviously. You know, what? Disney. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, but it's the same as it, look, if if there were a Darth Vader impersonator out on the street and you took a photograph and you arted it up, you know, um huh. you, you know, what are they going to what uh what's the case there? Right. Yeah, and there um, are people who yeah, there are the people especially even where you are in Los Angeles, there are people who impersonate characters on the street that do that for a living and I'm sure that they're always getting in trouble for doing it or huh. And it's also yeah, like do you really want to go after those people making like you know, tens of dollars on the street doing that or yeah. I guess I don't know how much they or, make. You know, there are there are paparazzi out there who photograph mm -hmm. uh, celebrities and and then yep. they sell photographs and so photography is yeah. really just a vast, like it's, there's so many things it does. I, you just brought up paparazzi and I was like, Oh my God, you're right. There's like yeah. a whole industry behind that. And all you do is follow people and take pictures. You don't even have to write the story. People write the story yeah. after you have the pictures. Yeah. There, there are, you know, the term photographer just, just covers such a, a wide ground. I mean, everybody is a photographer. You've taken a photo. You're a photographer. Oh yeah. Um, you know, a lot of photographers are simply, you know, they're recorders. Mm -hmm. They're they're taking a shot and they're saying, hey, this happened at, you know, this place and this is what it looked like. Um, yeah, that's one type of photography. And, and that's photography that's very much, uh, you know, consumption based. 
Uh, it's the same thing as taking a selfie. Look, I was here at the Grand Canyon, you know. Yeah. Throwing that out. Uh, yeah, the, the... So, yeah, it is fascinating like that. And look, I take those photos too, but, uh, um, you know, for the artistic stuff, it's very much like there's an intention behind it and, and a lot of thought, a lot of effort, you know. Yeah, how do you lay out so. photos that you take? Like it, sometimes you have to stage things as well because you want to capture a certain thing, like the one where there was the mother looking down and the boy pointing. Like, do you draw yeah. those out or do you just picture it in your head and try no, to arrange I, no, things? No, I, I, th that was that was a found moment. That was very much, I went there. Okay. Um, you know, and that's more kind of the street photography. The street photography is is going out and, and trying to find the art, you know, in those those moments. You know, there are times when, yes, I have a, a, a definite concept that I want to uh, shoot. And I will, I will do everything that I can to shoot that concept. And then I'll shoot beyond the concept. Um, because sometimes the best photograph is not your concept. Mm -hmm. It might be close to it. It might be something different. You might get to, to, to where you are and, and realize that there's something better there. So... My goal is to be is is going into that situation is two things is one to be prepared to be very prepared for that that preconceived notion that I have mm -hmm. but then once a shoot starts uh, is to shoot that notion and to just and let it go to let it go to be free enough so that in that moment I can also experiment and be creative at that time. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a two pronged okay. <laughs> approach. And do you still work in digital or do you, or I'm sorry, do you still work in film or do you work in digital? Uh, it's all digital okay. right now. I, I do, I do love film. It's certainly where I got my start and, you know, I've built dark rooms and <clears throat> I love that process. It's very, very meditative and printing and I, I hope to get back to it. Uh, you know, someday when I have a little more more time and maybe a little more space, um, it's with photography. Every different camera that you use and every different process that that you go through, it changes the way that you photograph. Makes sense. And and so, you know, I when I was in school, we shot a lot with four by five cameras. That you know, the old cameras. You know, you're putting the hood over your your. Oh, head. really? And yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know they're heavy. They require a heavy tripod, and so those thoughts or, or those photographs, that you know, you have to think about them. You're lining it up. You're taking your time. You're not going to use a four by five to to go shoot sports. Um, <laughs> you know, so you know you're. I'd love to see it though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, you know, your thirty-five millimeter camera was more like, hey, I'm going to take this around and yeah. and uh, you know do it. So. You know, look in the studio. I use, you know, a forty thousand dollar camera on a, you know, studio pod, and and uh, yes, I move it around a, a lot, but it usually stays in a fixed position. Yeah. Um, but when I'm out on the street, you know, I'm shooting with a, a little Panasonic camera. That's I don't even shoot with a professional thirty five millimeter camera uh, when I'm doing straight street photography because I don't want to look like a photographer. Mm. I don't, I, you know, I've been in that situation. Uh, years ago, I, I went to, uh, to Bosnia. My brother lives in Bosnia and I was photographing there and, you know, I was walking around with this 35 millimeter DSLR that, that was about a year's worth of salary for the average person in, in Bosnia. And I'm like, this is just not a good idea. What were you doing <laughs> in Bosnia? No, my, my, my brother lives there. He loves really? it. And I'm just going to visit. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a lovely, lovely country. Um, so, you know, and I've had, sometimes you learn the same lesson, like over and over again. Uh, years ago, I did a little fashion suit shoot on the side of the Lincoln Memorial. It was just with some friends. I was, you know, I was, I was young and the security guard came up and, uh, you know, is asking what you're doing. Because we had like clothes laid out. We had, you know, this was before, you know, 9-11 and all of that. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, we're just, you know, taking some photos. He's like, are you professional? I'm like, 
no. He's like, all right, no tripods. I'm like, yep, nope, didn't even bring one. Um, and it used to be that at national parks and monuments, if you had a tripod, they'd stop you, you know, because they're like, oh, professional photographer, you need to get, you know, permission and everything. But if you didn't really? have one, they'd let you do a lot of things. Um, so there are these little kind of signposts. It, you know, it taught me, oh, maybe it's not a good idea to bring a tripod or to bring too much gear because then, you know, someone's going to start asking questions. And and out on the street, I use what a lot of people would consider to be like just a tourist camera. Nobody bothers me. Nobody asks me what I'm doing. Nobody talks to me. They just assume I'm a tourist huh. and they say nothing. And I, I like that. I, I, I don't want people to, you know, think, oh, this is a professional. He's trying to make money on this stuff. Right. So we got to, you know, we got to rein him in. Do you no, ever it's... get uh, crashers or, or photo bombers? <laughs> uh, you know, once in a while, but uh, not often. Uh, I did a series of, of like reflections and windows on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. And, you know, so sometimes they've got mannequins in, in like these, you know, Hustler Hollywood stores. And so sometimes I'll be taking a picture of those and people will look at me funny like, <laughs> what you... right. why are you taking a picture of that? Why are you taking a picture? He must really like this. I don't know. You know. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes you get a weird look, but uh, yeah. you do it enough. You learn just to, you know, just well, to kind of work that out. And the reason I asked that too is just because that would be the other benefit of not looking like a professional photographer because somebody's going to be like, oh, I'm going to get in this photo or, you know, like they're doing a photo shoot. Just, and that's not even like they want to get famous by doing it. It's one of those like, oh, they're doing a thing. Let's mess with them. You know, like the, <laughs> the other day it, that actually happened to me the other day. I saw this guy standing in the middle of the street and he was standing there weird. And I'm like, wait a minute, I know what's happening. So I looked to my left and there was a person across the street with a camera and I'm like, ah, somebody's getting an album cover done. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it was, it was just so obvious, but, and I wanted to do something and I'm like, you know what? They weren't hurting anybody. Why do I need to mess with them? Right. So I moved on. But, it, but there's that brief moment yeah. where I'm like, I wanted to jump in and like, they'd get a photo with well, me in it. I, um, I've, I've got a story about that. Okay. But, but wait for one second. Um, you know, I, I live in Los Angeles and I, I work in Hollywood. Uh, and so it is very commonplace to see somebody walking, you know, with their like taking pictures of themselves, mm -hmm. walking around with their phone, like doing some kind of live chat. We just see it all of the time. So so the act of someone taking a photograph is just not a special event. It's just every day, you know. Good point. Um, you know, you can you can drive and you know, buy and you'll see someone shooting something for TV or for a movie. It's just, it's very, you know, commonplace uh, here. So people, for the most part, they're, you know, they leave you alone. Yeah. Uh, which is good. Um, yeah, I did, I did a story. Well, <laughs> I like, this, this is uh, already affecting you. I love how you're building up to this. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a funny story, uh, about dealing with another photographer and I was accidentally in his shot. Okay. Um, and it was at my grandfather's funeral. Oh, no. And, well, my grandfather was in the military. He was a colonel. And so uh, when he died, we had him buried in Arlington. And because he was a colonel, he, uh, it was his right uh, to have kind of the full military uh, ceremony, yeah. which, you know, involves a, a band, a, a horse with a a boot in the stirrup that's reversed, uh, this whole, you know, uh, you know, and this whole kind of procession. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said to my family, I said, look, you know, I, I want to photograph this because this is probably the, the only chance I'll get to photograph an event like this in my life, you know, and, and my family was like, yeah, we want you to, you know, we want you to. So, uh, the morning of the you know the funeral i'm there and i do see another photographer kind of off taking photos you know it's arlington national cemetery they're you know always someone yeah but i'm you know the the procession starts and so i'm kind of like hovering around you know just 
um, trying to, to get photos from every angle and close-ups and, you know, I'm just, I'm literally, I'm right there. I'm not blocking the procession, but, you know, I'm right next to it shooting all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and at one point I stop and, you know, the procession kind of, you know, start is going to the, the final, you know, to the grave. And, uh, I just turn and I happen to see this photographer and he's waving his hands like this. And I'm like, what? And I look at him. He's like, get out of the shot. <laughs> he's like, I'm trying to get the long shot. Get out of the shot. <laughs> and, and, you know, a whole bunch of thoughts went through my head at the, you know, at, at that time. At first I was like, well, get your own dead grandfather. <laughs> you, know, this one's mine. <laughs> you know, but then I was like, I had seen the guy before the ceremony. I realized, you know, it's not every day that they do this full procession. Mm. And the guy had probably been waiting for an hour or two, you know, trying to get a shot for himself, you know, of this. And he was far off. He probably thought I was the most disrespectful jerk in the world because I'm right there trying to get the thing. Yeah. So, you know, I paused for a minute. I stepped out of his shot. I let him got his, get his shot. And then, you know, I, I moved on. But uh, that's an interesting take that you had on that. That's it, instead of, I mean, my first thing would have been to completely be angry at him and go like, you know, shut up. Don't tell me what to do. And ex or exactly like you said, like, you know, get your own grandfather. <laughs> my God. It's, it's, but, but I love the fact that you comprehended what was going on because of the background of that you had. And you're like, oh, I'm, Okay, he's trying to do a thing. It's one second. It it's something he's been wanting to get away. And you respected the art form, I guess, in, in a sense. But yeah, huh? I, I like yeah, the no, I, I like I, the way that you thought about that. I I I love photography. I love other photographers. I also hate other photographers. I could, you know, I could as, see that as well. <laughs> it's it's kind of the way it works. It's like you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I hate that I get what you mean. <laughs> like, it's the one thing about being an artist that I hate. I wish I had the ability not to have that knee-jerk reaction of jealousy and hatred for people in the same field. Because when you meet them, it's always, most of the time, it's it's fantastic to know those people and have like-minded people to talk to and discuss things with. But at the same time, be jealous of, the fact that they're able to do it too. Mm. <laughs> or at least that's well, my take on it. They may, that yeah. may not be what you meant at all. <laughs> no, no, I, I, um, I, I'm one of the worst people to go to a museum with because uh, I'm not <laughs> indifferent to the art. You know, they're, they're, I see things that I love and then, you know, half of, half of it is, is maybe stuff that I like, you know, a small percentage 10 20 percent i love and i think oh this is great mm -hmm. and then like the rest of it i'm like how why is it here why is it on the wall this is a waste of space mm. and, I, and i'm like who is the curator who is the the the, the guy or the, the the woman who can see the value in this great stuff but also thinks this stupid stuff is good as as well and you know i'll i'll walk out of it and you know and i'll just be so like happy that i saw this amazing work and and just angry that i i saw it and, and my wife had the best shut up line of of all time okay she's like she's like well if you don't like that work so much replace it oh and i was like oh yeah I was, I was put in my place then i was like okay that's a very it's a very good point <laughs> i was gonna go with the what you were saying before where it spoke to some people. It just didn't speak to you. I mean, that's the other thing about when yeah, you're saying and, don't interpret the art for people, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, I don't get it. Just like top 40 radio. Don't get a lot of it, but at the same time, can't really be upset that they're doing better than I am. So I'm doing something wrong, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now it, it's, you know, we don't, we don't get a say, we don't get a say in, in, in who likes our work or, or how, you know, it, it gets in interpreted and yeah. And yeah. It's, it obviously speaks to somebody, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think that everybody has the right to, to put, to make value judgments on, on art. You can say, you know, okay, not my thing. I don't understand it. And that's, that's okay. But you know, you also can say, I don't like it. 
mm-hmm. I don't think it's good art. It, it's you know, of course, uh, it's all it's all art, but uh, you know, we we get to be our own experts. Uh, and I think that you know, if you're an artist yourself, you have to have an opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to have a viewpoint, and and the the degree to which you love things and the degree to which you hate things. I think they it all speaks to the level of passion that you have yeah. uh, about something. Um, if you don't love your art, if you don't really care about it, then you'll never get angry, <laughs> you know. But you also just you also won't fall in love with something. So I, I think you know you need to have that passion, and if you don't, you really need to know ask why. Why don't I have that? Wow. Uh, I love that. That was a good closing line. So what kind of things do you have coming up? Is there anything in the works that you're working on right now or things that you have going Mm. on that you'd like to mention? Uh, Nothing that I'm going to actively promote. I I am one of the things I've always been fascinated with kind of as an artist is, is really how to, to lead the eye uh, through a photograph and, and some of the psychological effects that language has on photography. Uh, I've written some articles. If if anyone's interested, the the Sammy's camera blog. If you just search for Than Clark, you can you can see a series I did on. I actually did find that when I was searching your name. Yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'll put a link um, to that in the in the show notes. Oh, thank you. Uh, I've always wanted to take a lot of those thoughts and and put them into a, a book form so they could all be in. Uh, one place, so that's that is something that I'm I'm working on, but that oh, really that will uh, take a while <laughs> to get to. Yeah, the yeah. taking pictures and then writing about the pictures are two completely different amounts of time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, yes, very much so. But it, it's uh, I'm I'm just so fascinated. You know, simple example. If it, you know the phrase, oh, oh things are looking up, mm-hmm. right? Okay, so what does that mean? It means that uh, there's a bright, you know, it's it's a positive statement. Oh, you know, there's something good in the future. Mm-hmm. Well, what happens when you take a picture of someone who's looking up? You get that same emotion. So much of like, oh, you know, they're looking down at, you know, they're looking down at me, or or they're looking down their nose at me. Mm-hmm. You know, you take a take a photograph of someone in that that position, and and you're getting that that same meaning. Um, so much of our language has come from describing these kind of body movements that we make. There's, there's this this back and forth. Uh, so, you know, you can think about the words we use to describe certain emotions, uh, like those ones, and the photograph to communicate them are it's the same. Mm-hmm. So you can actually use language, and you can use how we talk about things to communicate something visually without actually using the language. Uh, stuff like that fascinates me. There's, you know, there are ways to show that people are powerful or that they're smart or that they're more, you know, uh, more compassionate by the way that you frame a photograph, hmm. um, you know, or the viewpoint that you, you, the point of view you take on it. There's so much you can communicate. And if you know what you want to communicate uh, with a photograph, then it's going to tell you how you want to frame it and the angle you want to use and sometimes what lighting you want to use or whether it should be color or whether it should be black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, so no one has really put that down has, has kind of expressed that or written that out in a way that people can go, Oh, okay. So, but you have no, yeah. you have no deadline or date for when that book is going to come out. No, I, I don't, I, I don't have it. No, no, okay. I don't. Well, I don't. you'll have to but keep I me posted. Will, I will let you know. I will keep you posted. Okay. I will keep you posted. All right, because I expect it on my desk Monday morning. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so I could probably do that, but <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, it, it just won't be cohesive. Um, no. The uh, and where could people go check out your work? Where should people go to find you? Uh, fanclark.com. and that's uh, with two ends. It is with two ends. Yes, yes. Um, and also, I'm on Instagram. Uh, let me double check. It's Than Clark. If you just do a search for me. You're gonna. Uh, you're going to find me, even though I think on Instagram, I might be than dash Clark or underscore. Right. 
I think it um, still shows up, but yeah, it's the it's the two ends. The T H A N N is what is what makes it unique. I don't think I've ever known somebody with the, the that name. Although it's not that out of the. I mean, the word the name Todd has two D's in it. Like, why are there two D's in Todd? So yeah, and and I I can't answer as to why. Uh, it's actually it's Than is my nickname. The full name's Nathaniel. Oh. But, uh, uh, I was named after a family friend, and he said, well, if you're going to name your kid after me, he's got to have the same nickname. And that was <laughs> with two N's. So That's I fascinating. Stopped, I don't know why. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with me today. I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you signed up to do this podcast. No, you know, I, I, I had to. Thank you very much for having me on. And, you know, I, I can't even remember how I got, like, hooked up with the, the podcast, but... Uh, I just remember reading something about kind of your your mission that you wanted to learn more mm-hmm. and wanted to do this podcast as a as a way to do that and I'm like oh I love that I just I love that that concept uh, and uh, I thought it was very kind of open of you to like put that out there it's like I want want to learn more so I'm gonna interview all these people I thought it was great yeah. so um, I'm I'm really happy to to be a part of it wow thank you so much. Mm-hmm.